Good evening. Thank you for joining us for the Brock Prize Symposium. I'm Ed Harris. I'm administrator for the Brock International Prize in Education. Three, thank you. <laughs> three, that was my wife probably. Three, three universities partner in this. And uh, that one is the University of Oklahoma, Oklahoma State University, and the University of Tulsa. So the three partner institutions alternate hosting the symposium. And obviously, uh, this year, it's University of Tulsa's turn. So I'd like to introduce you to someone who will give you an official TU welcome. Dr. Kara Gay Neal is director of the School of Urban Education in the Hendry Kendall College of Arts and Sciences. Kara Gay is one of the most respected educational leaders in Oklahoma and an ardent supporter of the Brock Prize. So it's with great pleasure, I introduce you to Dr. Kara Gay Neal. Thank you, Dr. Harris. On behalf of the University of Tulsa and the School of Urban Education, we are honored tonight to be the hosting institution of this rare opportunity to have an educator of such world renown as Dr. Howard Gardner speak with us tonight. So with that, I want to say welcome to Tulsa, Dr. Gardner, and also thank you all for joining us tonight. I'd like to mention just one more person before we begin our symposium. I'd like to introduce you to the person who founded the Brock Prize. If it wasn't for this person, we would not be here tonight for this symposium. John Brock is a native Oklahoman. He graduated from the University of Oklahoma with a degree in geological engineering, and, a, and as most of you know, is a successful oil and gas entrepreneur. Through word and deed, he and his wife, Donnie, demonstrate their dedication to making our world a better place, and one of, this, one of the ways that they do this is through rewarding education. John often reminds us that the most important thing we do in life is to educate our children. So I'd like to introduce you to the founder and benefactor of the Brock International Prize in Education, John Brock. There may be some of you here tonight that are not familiar with the prize. The prize is unique. Uh, what it is, is, is the mission of the Brock Prize in Education is to discover the best educational ideas, to find those ideas that are unique, that are innovative, and especially those ideas that work. One of the things uh, that we really want about this idea is for it to make an impact on society. It's not just any idea. Probably all of you here in this room have great ideas. How, how much that I, those ideas make, the impact they make on society is what we look, look for. And so we put together a little brief uh, video that explains what the Brock Prize is about. discovered a lot of good ideas, new ways to educate, new ways to, for, that people learn that we have yet to adopt into our schools. And that's the, what the Brock Prize hopes to accomplish is expose our educators to uh, those new ideas, new ways of teaching and learning. We want to help shape a culture of innovation and discovery by finding and rewarding the best ideas in education. We want to find the ideas that make a difference in the way we think and the way we act. We consider our laureates as the heroes and heroines of the global educational community and we want to share their ideas with the world. If the whole country cared about teachers and education the way that John and Donnie do, we'd be really 
soaring, and teachers would be the rock stars of America. to thank Chris Ormsby and the Institute for Teaching and Learning Excellence for helping us produce that. And uh, it's our, our first one. We're going to be working on it, but, we're, but it sort of gives you a, a three-minute synopsis of what we're about, as well as the, our laureates. Uh, this is, we have a live audience tonight, and we also have a, quite a big virtual audience. I, I will, when I leave here, I will... Um, find out the numbers and let you know at the end, but we, this is probably our biggest uh, symposium that we've had, including our live and virtual audiences. At the end, you will have, well, we're gonna have a question and answer uh, time from the audience, and so I'm gonna read these instructions for you. The instructions are also on the little card that you have, but through, throughout tonight's program, we'll accept questions from our live audience as well as those who are watching online. To submit a question, simply text or email us following the instructions at the bottom of the screen. For those of you at the live event, instructions are also printed on the cards you receive when you enter the building. Your questions will be transmitted electronically to our discussants for the Q&A session at the end of the evening. And you, begin, you may begin submitting your questions at any time. Uh, and before I begin, if, if I was to ask Susie if she could bring uh, water for our discussants up here. Or do we have water right here? Never mind, I can do it. It's part of being the administrator for the Brock Prize. We even have glasses. <laughs> To join us online uh, about, the sim, uh, with the, about the symposium, follow us on Twitter and comment hashtag Brock Symposium. We also invite you to like us on Facebook and comment on today's post for an opportunity to win one of several great prizes we are offering. Complete details can be found on the symposium handout you received when you entered the building. Now we can begin with our conversation with Howard Gardner. First, I'd like to introduce you to the person who nominated Howard Gardner, Rick Miller. Dr. Richard Miller is the president and first employee of Olin College of Engineering. With a background in applied mechanics and an interest in innovation and leadership in higher education, Rick is renowned for, for his visionary leadership and has received multiple awards, including the 2013 Bernard M. Gordon Prize from, from the U.S. National Academy of Engineering for Innovation in Engineering, and the Marlowe Award for Creative Distinguished Administrative Leadership. 
One of the things that's unique about Olin, many things are unique about Olin College of Engineering, but most, some of you are in education in some way or other. And each year, over 100 institutions from around the world come to visit Olin College of Engineering to see what kind of innovative practices are going on there and to learn what's going on in engineering so it can be applied in other fields. So it's with great pleasure, I introduce you to the Brock Prize juror who nominated Howard and president of Olin College of Engineering, Dr. Rick Miller. Thank you. It's, um, it's a real privilege to be here tonight. I want to tell you a little bit about my friend and the, um, and the Brock Prize winner, uh, Dr. Howard Gardner. So about a dozen years ago, on a flight from Boston to San Francisco, I happened to sit next to a distinguished man who was busy reading a thick manuscript. I guessed he was an academic and, and introduced myself, even though I'm sure he would have preferred not to be interrupted. Um, this man turned out to be one of the most influential cognitive scientists of the past 100 years, and he was willing to talk with me about my struggle to start a new college from scratch, and he did this for nearly six hours. That talk opened my eyes to profound new insights and literally changed my life, as well as helped me create an entirely new learning model for engineering education. Now, I'm not sure whether it was fate or divine intervention um, that I was assigned to the seat next to Professor Howard Gardner. Since then, I've returned many times for inspiration and guidance, and we've become good friends. So it's a great personal privilege and a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Gardner this evening and then I'm going to remain here on stage to interview him about a wide range of topics because I think you'll find him to be a fascinating public intellectual. Howard Gardner is the John H. and Elizabeth A. Hobbs Professor of Cognition and Education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education where he has been throughout his professional career. He also serves as an adjunct professor of psychology at Harvard University and senior director of Harvard's Project Zero. He has received numerous honors throughout his career. In 1981, he received a MacArthur Prize Fellowship, the so-called Genius Award, and in 2000, he received a fellowship from the John S. Guggenheim Memorial Foundation. In 1990, he was the first American to receive the University of Louisville's Grauemeyer Award in Education. He's received 30 honorary degrees from colleges and universities in Bulgaria, Canada, Chile, Greece, Ireland, Israel, Italy, South Korea, and Spain. In 2005 and again in 2008, he was selected by Foreign Policy and Prospect magazines as one of the 100 most influential public intellectuals in the world. In 2011, he received the Prince Asturias Award for Social Sciences from the Prince of Spain. He's an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, the National Academy of Education, and the Royal Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufacturers, and Commerce. He serves on the governance boards of Amherst College, New York's Museum of Modern Art, and the American Philosophical Society. Howard is the author of 29 books translated into 32 languages, as well as several hundred articles but that's not why he's here tonight. The reason he's here tonight is not about this exceptional record of academic <coughs> achievement. Few people in history have had a greater global impact on the field of education than Professor Howard Gardner. For example, his theory of multiple intelligences, first introduced in 1983, has changed our basic understanding of how the brain works and what intelligence and education mean. This theory stands out for its widespread and profound influence throughout the entire field of education and for the unmistakable evidence of its international impact. It's been called, quote, a blockbuster in American education, unquote, and, quote, contemporary education's most popular idea. There now exist hundreds of books on the theory of multiple intelligences. Many schools throughout the world that are based on its principles and at least six schools in the United States that are named for Howard Gardner. His work was also highly influential to us in establishing Olin College of Engineering, 
particularly in the development of our admission program and also in our pedagogical goals. While multiple intelligence theory was a major contribution, it's certainly not his only contribution, and I think we'll explore that tonight in our conversation. More recently, he's developed important research and contributions to the concept of good work, the study of collaboration in higher education, the study of conceptions of quality in the contemporary era, and an exciting new major study of liberal arts and sciences in the 21st century. So ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to Professor Howard Gardner. Well, I think that uh, Rick is gonna be tossing questions to me. Um, so I'll simply say that uh, he's a good and valued friend. He also tends to overstatement, so I will uh, <laughs> attempt to deflate some of his uh, hyperbolic comments about me, but there's nothing hyperbolic about our friendship and my respect for what he's accomplished, both at the Olin College of Engineering and in getting people all over the world, including here in Tulsa, to think differently about education in general. Uh, I guess I should check, uh, are we both audible? Okay, take it away. <laughs> okay, well I think we should start at the beginning. Um, the multiple intelligence theory is the primary reason why um, the Brock Prize is given to you. And so I'm wondering if you could begin by sort of explaining to us what multiple intelligence theory is and by the way, you might also uh, explain how you became engaged in this topic uh, so many years ago. Sure. I think one reason why multiple intelligences has become very popular in education is because you can summarize the claims very succinctly. About 100 years ago, psychologists um, took the word intelligence, which exists in most languages, and created a test which we all know about called the IQ test. It's quite similar to the SAT, a little bit different from the ACT. And before that, people just used the word smart or intelligent or bright, or British people like to use the word wit. Um, but starting 100 years ago, we actually had a way of measuring intellect called the IQ test. And the IQ test is a great invention, and I have no objection to it per se, but the research I did over 30 years ago, starting in the early 70s and continuing till I published my book about multiple intelligences, suggested that what we measure in IQ tests if you only have an hour, it's a pretty good way of telling who's going to succeed at a certain kind of school. Because in my terms, what an IQ test tests is linguistic and logical ability, and in the schools which existed 100 years ago in Europe and other places, including the United States, if you knew somebody's IQ, um, it was a pretty good predictor of how well they would do in school. But, and here's where the innovation in my conceptualization came in, I said, let's say you were the proverbial visitor from Mars. You didn't know about schools, you didn't know about tests, but you simply observed people all over the world and you saw what they did, what they did well, what was valued, what was important in the South Seas where people sail from one island to another just looking at the stars in the sky, what was important in the uh, plains of, uh, and savannas of East Africa thousands of years ago when people hunted and gathering, hunted and gathering. Um, what can people be prodigious at? Music, chess. Um, you would get a much more varied view of human cognitive capacities. And so beginning around 1975 and going into high gear around 1979, I surveyed everything that was known about human cognition all over the world, all the sorts of abilities and skills which were valued, what we knew about how these abilities were organized in the brain, 
We know much more now than we did then, but we, there was already some knowledge then. What we knew about genetics and what's called heritability, again, we knew a little bit then, we know much more now. And I finally came up with a list of seven abilities, and I was willing to defend those abilities in a book of 400 pages. But as I've often said, I wouldn't be here tonight. I wouldn't have gotten the Brock Prize if I'd written a book called Seven Talents, because nobody has any problem with saying that somebody's talented in music or somebody's talented in athletics or somebody's talented in leadership. The, 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 the fight that I picked without really realizing it was by using the word intelligence and saying there's linguistic intelligence, there's mathematical intelligence, but there's also musical, spatial, bodily kinesthetic, interpersonal or social, intrapersonal, and I, I would add a few others. Um, by using the word intelligence, I was stepping on the turf of the people who make the IQ tests, and to put it simply, they weren't very happy about that, but it got a lot of attention, and now most psychologists know about the theory, often they grumble about it. It has had by far the biggest impact in schools, as Rick said, but also in, in workplaces. And um, kind of uh, one funny thing about being an author is where you crop up where you don't expect to. About 20 years ago, um, my book was the subject of the New York Times double crostic. And recently, John Cleese of Monty Python wrote a book about his abilities, and I didn't realize what, how smart I was until I read Howard Gardner's book. And <laughs> it's nice to have good reviews, but the real excitement is if you're in the crossword puzzle or if you're in Monty Python. <laughs> That's terrific. Um, so how did the world respond to the theory when you first published it? What did the psychologists have to say? What was going on in Washington at the time in 1983? So that's a multifaceted question. Um, psychologists did notice it, and as I said before, they weren't overly inviting, uh, but they weren't disrespectful either, and we, we can talk about that later. Um, but I'd written a half a dozen books before then, and they'd all had reasonable reception and actually got more reviews then than my review books do now, even though I'm much better known, and that's because there were more review journals. But I know exactly the moment when I realized this was different. Some of you know New York City and the Hilton Hotel on 54th Street and 6th Avenue. You've probably been to conferences there, Rick. And I was giving a talk there, actually, to the um, the independent school network, private schools, NAIS, National Association of Independent Schools, and I was in room, we'll call it 5D, and when I got up there, I couldn't get into the room. And when I walked into the room, a hush went over the room, and I said to myself, this is what Andy Warhol is talking about this is my 15 minutes of fame. <laughs> and it's true that, that I got more attention in that time than ever thereafter. And as Rick nicely pointed out, and this is amazing actually, um, the idea has lasted. Uh, I'm very honored to get the Brock Prize. 80% of my email is still about multiple intelligences. And one of my most touching experiences is that in 2009, we published a book called Multiple Intelligences Around the World, and 42 authors from 15 countries and five continents talked about how they used the idea. And I can be absolutely straight, I had no conception when I put this idea forth in the early 80s that anybody would pay attention to it. I was basically a psychologist, so I didn't really expect non-psychologists, educators, to uh, pay attention to it. But they did, and they've continued to pay attention to it. 
And you should not think that people are immune to the effects that they have on others. I didn't think of myself as an ed educationalist in 1983, but I certainly think of myself as that now. And I'm in a school of education. I was not teaching in a school of education at the time. And uh, it really shifted my, my primary scholarly focus. So from your work on uh, multiple intelligence theory and many other topics over the years that you've worked and published in, how should we as educators think about what it means to understand material in school? I have definite ideas about understanding. And to be blunt, they don't particularly come out of multiple intelligences theory. Um, you mentioned the, the date 1983. Um, I don't know whether the Red Sox won that year. I don't think that they did. Uh, I'm sure some Oklahoma football team won at that time. But I think the reason you mentioned it is because that's the year that education, especially K-12 education, really came on the front page of the, of the newspaper, and it's never disappeared since. For those of you who remember that time, uh, Ronald Reagan had commissioned a report called a nation at risk. And his actual motivation was to get rid of the Department of Education, um, but it backfired because the report was very powerful. And it basically argued that the United States used to have the most impressive pre-collegiate education in the world, and that was no longer true. And even though I think the report was flawed, I think that the, the, there was a lot of truth to the indictment. For those of you who don't monitor this carefully, higher education in the United States is still the gold standard. People come from all over the world to visit our colleges and universities. You heard that over 100 schools each year go to Olin just to see what uh, Rick and his colleagues are, are doing. But while we have wonderful schools all over the country in general, our schools are not admired. In fact, uh, Places like Finland and Singapore, which have very different kinds of educational systems, are much more admired. And I think actually with, with good reason. You can ask me later if you want, tweet the, <laughs> tweet, the, tweet the question about why those schools are justifiably more um, admired. But to get to your question, which I still remember actually, <laughs> uh, but none of you do. <laughs> uh, um, I began to say, well, what is it that I really value as a teacher and as a learner? I've got four kids and three grandchildren and uh, uh, have had, it may be interesting to you, I actually began teaching piano from 1958 to 1969 and I taught K through two, kindergarten through second grade in 1968 and 69 and in Newton, Mass. And of course, I've taught college students and graduate students ever since. What I'm really interested in is students understanding something. Now, if I ask you who's against understanding, only if you are perverse would you raise your hand. I mean, understanding is like mother and apple pie. You, nobody's against it. But the way I believe that we test understanding is not by asking people to give us something back which we gave them. So. If, if, if you know, you've been taught something and you can give it back, you may understand it, but you may just be, have a good memory or have a, you know, be able to mimic. Understanding means if I give you something new, something unfamiliar, and I say, can you explain this? Can you make sense of it? Can you help me along in unpacking this? If you can draw on knowledge, skills, nowadays search engines, um, any kind of uh, 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 powerful source of data, if you can draw on those things to help answer that question, to help unpack it, illuminate it, then you have what I call a performance of understanding. It's a term that I, that I created about 25 years ago. And if you can't actually perform your understanding, then 
at the very least, you should be able to say, what could I do to be able to have a better understanding of that issue? Um, and if you fall back on, well, we didn't cover that, so I can't answer it, or, you know, I'm clueless about how to go about um, approaching it, then I failed as a teacher. And I don't say this with any pride. Um, my Harvard students have a good memory. And when I ask them about something that they've been taught explicitly, they do very well. But I've been shocked by how often they don't have good performances of understanding. But I don't blame them, I blame myself. Because what we really want to do in education is equip people to be able to deal with something new, not something completely bizarre. I mean, if you say to me, you know, explain Stephen Hawking's theories, and I've never studied physics, I'm not going to know what to do. But if I've uh, studied economics class, and you say to me, well, you know, uh, are we really in a, in a period of secular stagnation that's different than we've, what we've had before, or is this just part of the the, the, the revenue cycle that we've had for 50 years. If I can't engage that, and there's not going to be any answer anywhere because people are still debating it, then I failed. I haven't had an understanding. But Rick, I warned you of this. I want to hear how you, what, how you think about this issue. How do you think about understanding? Well, that's, um, I'm not, this is not an equal debate here. Um, <laughs> and this is the student talking to the teacher. Um, we're still struggling with that, but understanding is a little bit different in different fields. Um, for an engineer, we basically imagine it to be developing um, an, a conception of the phenomenon that you're thinking about that allows you to make useful predictions into the future. And for an engineer to do this, there needs to be a some degree of reliable precision. And in most engineering cases, it's about plus or minus five to 10%. So if you can come up with a, a reliable method of making useful predictions of things that you need to know um, that's reasonably accurate, um, we consider that to be a good thing. But as, as you were mentioning, it's really important um, that your method of teaching um, prepares them to deal with the unexpected. Um, and it's the unexpected which really determines um, whether you can manage your way through reality in, um, in the physical world. It turns out that nature doesn't give partial credit. Um, either the airplane takes off or it doesn't. And you can't cheat on Newton's laws even once. Uh, it always will make you fail. So there's a harsh master there in this whole thing. Um, but I'd like to ask you another question about multiple intelligence theory. Because uh, as I, in, encounter people around the world and they all seem to have uh, an affection for this and their own way of interpreting it. And one really common um, example of this is the conception that there are some people in the world who are auditory learners and there's some people who are visual learners. Um, and if so, what does this mean? And what are the implications for thus, those of us in education? Well, um, let me first say there's one group that has no sympathy at all, and that's mathematicians. <laughs> they think there's only one way to be smart until they have a child with a learning problem, <laughs> and then they become an instant convert. But you're right, I mean, uh, and this would be interesting to take a look at the 13 or so previous winners of, of Brock. Um, often, ideas which appeal in education are ideas which fit into our intuitions, but ones that nobody has articulated before. You and I were talking before, and it'll come up again tonight, about grit. Now, in a sense, everybody knows that people who work hard at stuff regularly um, get better, and those people who depend upon miracles don't. But when Angela Duckworth coined the phrase grit and found a simple way to measure it, uh, that got people's attention. I'm not saying she's going to win the Brock Prize next year, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's... So I think in many ways, MI theory kind of fit into people's intuition. But we all have things that bug us, and I'm bugged by the assimilation of multiple intelligences to learning styles. Now, 
if a teacher or a parent or a child talks about having different learning styles and they're talking about multiple intelligences, I don't shake them or kick them. Um, <laughs> but in fact, multiple intelligences is a claim about a set of computers we have in our head and how well these computers work. So it's likely that Rick has a much better spatial computer than I do. I probably have a better linguistic computer than he does, and I have no idea uh, which of us has a better mathematical or musical computer, because we haven't played those games with each other. Um, and that's what MI theory is about, full stop. Again, if, if somebody says, comes up to me and says, I'm a visual learner, I don't hit them. Uh, <laughs> But in fact, I'm a scholar, and language differs enormously to me. So typically, somebody will say that they're, visual, that they're a visual learner if they can't read well. But reading is visual. So if you're a visual learner, you should be able to read well. People say to me, I'm an auditory learner, and then I see whether they can sing a song back, and they can't at all. So they're misusing the words visual and auditory, and they're confusing the processor with the transducer. Now, what does that mean? Linguistic intelligence means how do you deal with language once it gets into your cortex? And for me, it doesn't matter whether it gets in through the eye, through the ear, or if you're blind, through your fingers. It's how does the language get, basically, if you're right-handed, to the left cortex and to Wernicke's area and Broca's area. Uh, similarly, um, auditory, um, you know, is, if I can read music well, I can hear music that way. I don't have to come through my ear. I can read scores. So to me, it's not a good use of language. It's a deceptive use of language. It's not which sensory organ comes in. It's how the computer deals with the stuff independent of what sensory organ is being used. And one of the fantastic things about living in the 21st century is that we can all be helped a great deal by different computational devices, which essentially do things for us which we may not be able to do things ourselves. So if Rick is as good a spatial thinker as I speculate he is, if you give him a fairly complicated uh, two or three dimensional figure, he could probably flip it around in his mind. I can't, but put it on the screen, I'm as good as he is. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is where technology can supplement our intelligences, and that's great. You know, a similar uh, comment that I hear a lot about the multiple intelligences is that the two of them that we are most familiar with in higher ed have to do with mathematical or logical intelligence and linguistic intelligence. The other ones seem more, um, unfamiliar, let's say. And we sort of imagine that a person who's really good at interpersonal intelligence is some kind of intuition about dealing with others. And so the, I see a grouping that shows up that says, well, if it's about mathematical or linguistic intelligence, these are cognitive skills. And essentially all the other intelligences are about non-cognitive skills. They're, they're not as easily measured by a multiple choice test, for example. Um, and so how, do you, how should we be thinking about cognitive versus non-cognitive skills? Well, I think that one of the um, lamentable tens, trends is the one you just mentioned. Um, people have begun to create, to use the phrase non-cognitive skills for things which aren't linguistic or aren't logical. But why should we think that spatial thinking or thinking with your body as a craftsman does or a surgeon or an athlete or thinking about other people and how to get agreement, mediate, why should we call those non-cognitive? I think that's, a, again, this is where language is important. That's just wrong. It's every bit as cognitive. It uses the brain every bit as much. Um, just if you don't believe me, start chopping away the brain and you'll see these things disappear. Um, now, being very involved with the arts myself, we didn't talk about that, um, 
I'd rather have people call them non-cognitive and think they're important than throw them away, but to think that to be an artist is any less cognitive than to be a scientist is just stupid. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you're a, clear a about that. A technical term. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. But there's only so many battles one can fight. Yeah. So if people say that empathy is non-cognitive, but if it's important, I say fine. But of course, how can you possibly put yourself in somebody else's place unless you're using your mind and your brain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's very helpful. So in your judgment, how should the findings of multiple intelligence theory shape our thinking about now learning environments, curricula, and teacher-student interactions in a classroom? Well, as I mentioned before, Rick, um, when I developed this theory, I was doing it as a psychologist, and I was very surprised and flattered that the take-up in this country and elsewhere was among educators. And for a long time, I mean, literally over a decade, I just watched and listened when other people made use of these ideas. And in 95% of the cases, I thought the uses of the ideas were quite reasonable. Um, sometimes I furrowed my brow a bit. Um, and in a few cases, it was quite, the use was quite destructive, and I think we'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, but having you know, lived in this world of MI, as we call it, for a long time, I now say that there are two primary educational implications. And they're very simple, um, but I think if they were taken seriously, um, we would have a much more educated world. And those two moves are individuation and pluralization. And again, you know, probably Socrates knew both of these things. Um, I didn't know Socrates, I'm not that old. Uh, um, <laughs> but my, I'm putting it into words and using multiple intelligences makes it more real. So what's individuation? Individuation means knowing as much as we can about the mind of every single learner and teaching the learner in ways that he or she can understand and assessing them in ways in which they can show what they learned, what they understand in my terms. Now there's one group that's always got individual education and that's the very wealthy because the very wealthy hire tutors one-on-one -on -one, and the tutor doesn't say, oh, Prince Charles can't learn, give me Princess Anne. Those are names I just made up. Uh, um, the tutor's job is to teach that person in a way that that person can learn. And when we pay a lot of money for kids to go to a special school, typically an independent school, it's because that child will get more individualized learning. And uh, anybody who says that it's easier to learn in a class of 30 than in a class of 15 you should not make them your superintendent, right? Uh, um, the, ama the amazing thing about living in our time, again, because of the whole digital world, is we can individuate more than ever before. Not only because we can deliver things in many ways, but because people can be more metacognitive. We can understand how it is that we learn, and we can look for devices, apps, approaches, tutors, who teach us in the way that uh, work for us, and the tutors don't have to be human. There are many intelligent tutors that are online. So that's individuation. Pluralization could have been done at any time in any place, but it requires one thing, and that is deciding what's really important. Because pluralization means taking something that's important and teaching it in lots of different ways. Um, there's nothing worse than a teacher, and I've been guilty of this myself, who when the teacher explains something or demonstrates it, and the student says, can you show it to me another way, that the teacher's paralyzed because they have only one way of teaching it. So the good teacher or the good teaching staff can present important ideas in multiple ways. I'm sure that's what happens in much of the teaching at Olin. And when you teach in multiple ways, two terrific things happen. Number one, you reach more people, because some people learn better 
artistically, some people learn better through games, some people learn better through um, jokes, some people learn better through grids, or through equations. So one thing is you reach more people. Second of all, and this may be like the first thing I said tonight that uh, might wake us all up, um, if you are taught something in many different ways, you come to appreciate what understanding is. Because understanding is the capacity to represent something that you know in many ways. Think of, let's say, the house you grew up in. You can describe it, you can draw a picture of it, you can recreate some of the sounds and maybe even the odors. You have many ways of representing it, you really understand it. And when I was talking earlier about understanding, it doesn't matter whether it's understanding the second law of dynamics or understanding what a powerful sonnet is, you can think about it in lots of ways. And if you think, can only think in one way, your understanding is very sclerotic, it's very limited. And whether you're a teacher or a student, you should strive for multiple ways of representing knowledge. Fascinating. Um, multiple intelligence theory is used all over the world. Uh, in some countries, it's implied uh, in very direct ways to the, the name of a school, uh, the curriculum development in the school, um, the goals of education, and it's being interpreted by people around the world and implied. And my real question is, what do you think of this? Is it being interpreted correctly in education today? And is it largely being implemented in ways which are sound and effective? And if not, uh, what, if anything, should be done? Well, the first thing I have to say, being an honest person, is that in most cases, I don't know what's being done. And every day I get emails saying, you know, point me to a multiple intelligences school. And I say, well, you know, there are one or two schools I know well, but basically I point them to the book I referred to, Multiple Intelligences Around the World, because I can't be a traffic cop. I can't go to India or to Indiana and look at what's happening and assess it. So in that sense, uh, I don't have a precise answer to the question. Of course, I've read about it and over the last 30 years, I've obviously visited many places which uh, you know, do multiple intelligences things, and I've learned a great deal from visiting those places. So basically, I'm a happy camper. I would say that 95% of the uses are good or at least not harmful. Um, but some of the uses have been quite abusive, and so just two years ago, I created a website called Multiple Intelligences Oasis. My wife came up with that name because an oasis is, you know, a source of nourishment in the middle of a desert. And so if you go to multipleintelligencesoasis.org, uh, it's supposed to tell you what I'm thinking about these things. And there we describe some things I like, and we also point our fingers at some things that I don't like. Um, I guess I would just as soon not go into those because I don't want to have anybody walk away and forget that it was stuff I don't like. But uh, we call it malpractices. And if you go to the MI website, you can see the things I don't like. But I, I would say mostly, I think it's a, it's a hopeful idea. It's a hopeful idea because it says there are different ways of being smart, there are different ways of reaching people, and there are different ways of understanding. And I, I have said this, I have to, say with a certain malice, the only thing that is accomplished when people are told their IQ is to make them feel bad if their IQ isn't high, because it's like a death sentence of how smart they are. When you begin to think about intellect multiply, even if people aren't absolutely good at anything, at least they're relatively good at some things. So it's a hopeful sign, and I know that uh, one of the things that John Brock has been interested in is ideas in education which give hope rather than just brand you, oh, you've got it. And it's equally sad, I get um, letters from people who are, I'm gonna be blunt, complete misfits. Um, but um, their one accomplishment in life is that they're in Mensa, which is the group for high IQ people. And 
you know, there are probably some wonderful people in Mensa, maybe here in the audience, but basically Mensa consists of people who did better on tests than they did in life. And, uh, 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 and uh, I will actually tell you one more anecdote because it's an interesting one. 15 or 20 years ago, I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times in which I argued against tests like the SAT being timed. And I said, I see no reason to time performance on a standardized test. Um, I said, with a student, I don't care how much time the student spends on something, I care whether he or she ultimately understands it. And there are a few professions, like being an airplane pilot or being a surgeon, where time is of the essence. And of course, nobody should be allowed to do those things just because they get a certain score on a test. Well, this was in the early days of email, at least for email for non-members you know, of ARPA. And so I was sitting at my computer, and I was getting a ding every 10 seconds. This blog, this op-ed, this blog really touched people's nerves. And about half the people loved what I said, but the other half didn't. Now, who were the other half? I didn't do a scientific study, but I'll tell you who they were. They were middle-aged men who had done better on the SAT than they had done in life. And that was their one great accomplishment, and they were not going to have to take it away by letting those dummies have an extra hour on the test. <laughs> no women. <laughs> well, we've talked a lot about multiple intelligence theory for um, good reason. I'd like to move on to things that you've been doing since then. So I noticed that uh, you've written more than 25 books now on many topics about cognition, education, learning. However, many of your more recent books are focused on the topic of good work. So what do you mean by good work? How did you get interested in this? Um, does this have to do with values and ethics? Um, in your opinion, how should we in education approach the subject of ethics and values and good? And is there a role for this in public education today? Or should there be? Or should there be? Yeah. Well, actually, um, I became interested in the subject of good work because of an MI experience, which I've written and talked about a lot, that in 1993, a colleague of mine in Australia wrote to me and said, Howard, your ideas are being used in Australia, and you're not going to like the ways in which they're being used. And I said, well, tell me. If there was email in those days, I certainly didn't know how to download attachments. So I asked the colleague to send me the reason why I wouldn't like what was being done. And he literally sent me a pile like this, you know, a foot or two, uh, more of papers. And he was absolutely right. The more I read, the less good I felt. And the smoking gun was an entire state in Australia was basing its academic curriculum on MI theory, and what they did was they took all the racial and ethnic groups in Australia, and they indicated which intelligences they had and which ones they lacked. This was total garbage, absolutely no evidence for it. I don't question the motives of people who came up with this program. They probably thought you know, they were doing good, but they weren't. So this was the first time in my life that I publicly denounced some applications of my ideas. I actually went on television in Australia. I said, this is pseudoscience. There isn't a shred of evidence for it. Moreover, I think it's destructive. Um, fortunately, that particular educational program was canceled. But this was transformative for me because I began to think for the first time, what is my responsibility as a scholar? Now, I'm a scholar, and I'm sure people here are scholars. And the truth is, most scholars are absolutely delighted if anybody pays any attention to anything they've written. Uh, I mean, I think the average thesis is cited once, and that's in the dissertation abstracts. Um, so I was tickled pink that people were citing me. Um, but I realized that if your ideas get to be known, if you don't take responsibility for how they're being used, then you can't expect anybody else to either. So with two close colleagues, Bill Damon and Mike Csikszentmihalyi, we developed in 1995, so 20 years ago, 
a project called the Good Work Project, in which we try to understand what good work was. It was a heavily empirical project. We studied nine professions, interviewed over 1,200 people in depth, and we came up with a definition of good work. Good work is a coming together of three different properties, each beginning with the letter E. Good work is technically excellent, it's personally engaging, and it's carried out in an ethical way. So let's take teaching, because many people here will be a teacher. What do we want from a teacher who's a good worker? One, he or she should know what they're doing. They should know their subject, whether it's engineering or economics or whatever. Number two, they should care. They should look forward to teaching and being with students and helping the students understand. They shouldn't be bored or angry. And three, they should carry it out in an ethical way. I mean, you can be quite knowledgeable and quite engaged and doing lots of harm. Um, excellence and engagement, I believe, are easier than ethics. So I've devoted really the last 20 years to trying to understand how to be a good worker, a good citizen, and a good person. And I'm really devoting my life to that. They're not the same thing, good work, good citizen, and good persons, but they're obviously related. Another thing that happened 10 years ago, which was again transformative, and you know, I'm pretty old, for something to tran be transformative 20 years ago, namely, Howard, you better pay attention to how ideas are used, you can't just assume it's gonna be okay. But 10 years ago, in a book uh, uh, published with Wendy Fishman, uh, I reported a very disturbing trait about young people then, and I have to say, I'm quite sure it's even more true now, and I say this with number one, sadness, and number two, I don't blame the young people because we're their role models, so the way they are is with their role models. What we found in this study was that young people admired good work, and they wanted to be good workers, but over and over again, we had the people say this, and listen carefully, they would say, we want to be ethical, and someday we will be ethical. We will serve as good role models. We will hire ethical people. But we can't afford to be ethical now because we want to be successful. And we're going to be damned if the people with whom we are in competition cut corners and we try to be ethical and we lose to them. So I didn't go to school with St. Augustine either. But Augustine famously said, oh, Lord, make me chaste, but not yet. <laughs> and this is what the young people, our children, or maybe some young people here were saying, we can't afford to be ethical now. And ethics is not something we can afford to put off. So my work now has been with young people, and I'm now doing a big study, as Rick knows, of, of college today, and trying to figure out um, you know, how we can help people develop a good ethical muscle. And uh, something very moving today, uh, uh, I asked the students who I spoke to here whether there was someone on campus who, when they're faced with an eth ethical dilemma, um, that uh, they would look to that person. And uh, usually when I ask this, at schools, I draw kind of a blank, and I was very touched that uh, here at the university, the, the provost was mentioned by a number of students as someone whom they would look up to. Um, it's very hard to be ethical if you don't have role models and you don't spend a lot of time thinking about what the right thing to do is when it's easier to cheat or to let a friend cheat and pretend it's okay or to cut corners when you're building a bridge because you might make more money or because you want to beat somebody else in doing it. But nobody should want to live in a society where the ethical muscle has become flabby. And I don't like when people say, well, haven't people always been unethical? The answer is I don't care. I care that we be ethical. And when, people, when, when individuals say, well, people all over the world are unethical, I say, no, there are big differences from one country to another, and we're not going in the right direction. And I, I could provide evidence for that.
Well, well time is running down, and uh, we're getting some questions uh, sent to us from the audience. And maybe the best way to do this, since I doubt we'll have time to do all of them, is for me to give you several at once that are somewhat related and allow you to choose which ones that you think are the most appropriate for your um, comments. So since we were just talking about ethics, uh, someone in the audience asked, um, is there a moral intelligence? And if so, how do we promote it, this type of intelligence in school? Another uh, question is, do you believe that all intelligences are malleable or are some of them actually fixed? I mean, we know about Carol Dweck's work, but there may be um, limits to this uh, sort of approach. I'll oh, stop sure. There. Okay. Yeah, I'm pretty good at being quick. So uh, okay. the answer is no, there's not a moral intelligence. Any intelligence can be used to moral or immoral purposes. Goethe wrote great German poetry in the German language, Goebbels fomented hatred. Both Nelson Mandela and Slobodan Milosevic had plenty of interpersonal intelligence. They used it in different ways. Even grit, which many of us are interested, can be used positively, but the, the, uh, the, uh, the Nazi foot soldiers had plenty of grit. That doesn't mean that morality isn't important. It's the most important thing, but it's not an intelligence. It's how you use that intelligence and only if you have role models and value systems, which you don't just cite, but you actually embody, do you have a, a moral world or do you have grit of the sort that we want. Um, no intelligence is fixed. They're all malleable. But the definition of having a strong intelligence is it changes and develops more quickly. I could have played the cello every day of my life for 20 hours. I would never be Yo-Yo Ma. Uh, I could also you know, have done physics for 20 hours a day, and I wouldn't be Stephen Hawking or, or Albert Einstein. Nonetheless, many people, including me, actually like to work in areas where our intelligences aren't very good. Um, and I've spent lots of time working in the area of the visual arts, even though I have no aptitude for that, because I want to. Uh, and that's fine, but you should simply know that some things are going to be easier for you to acquire than others, because your computer is better. Terrific. Um, what do you think about arts and creativity? I'm against it, both. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, nowadays, creativity is a, is a buzzword, and I've got nothing against creativity. Again, you know, Osama bin Laden was very creative, but we just assume not breed people like that. There's a big error in collapsing art with creativity. Um, any pursuit can be done creatively, whether it's engineering or economics or politics. And of course, the creativity can be good or bad. Um, uh, much art likes to be creative, but doesn't succeed. Um, and in fact, in most cultures, art is quite um, conformist. I don't mean that in a bad sense, but you know, in traditional Chinese painting, for example, you don't try to do things differently from other people. That's not the goal. In modern Western society, we put a premium on things being different, but a lot of stuff that's different isn't, isn't particularly impressive either. So the way I think about it, um, and I could talk a long time about the arts. Arts are areas in which people use different symbol systems to convey ideas, emotions, um, perspectives, um, and uh, as, you know, as Isadora Duncan, famous dancer, said, if I could put it in words, I wouldn't have to dance it. I mean, you, even poets, they're not putting it in the words the way the rest of us do. You know, and you write poetry uh, because you can say things in a poem that you can't say in a literal language. Um, and undoubtedly, I don't know anything about computers. There are all sorts of art forms that will be developed around coding and around uh, uh, p computer programs and fine. But uh, just doing something novel is not interesting. You've got to do something novel that eventually affects people and, 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 and you know, has, some, has some staying power. I mean, I could give the rest of the today hopping on this microphone, and it'd be quite original, but the, you know, would not have any particular impact on people. 
they would just say, well, he's as bizarre as we think we are, <laughs> he, uh, as we think he is. So, yeah, so those are semantic things. But, um, you know, I'm studying liberal arts now, and a lot, of, a lot of the reason for studying liberal arts is to get clarity about thinking. And you have to pay a lot of attention to language and its implications. And so, you know, when people, you know, say, you know, people are visually intelligent, I get upset because I don't think it's an accurate use of, word, of language. And when people say, well, you can only be creative in the arts, again, I get upset because you can be creative in any area. Maybe you don't want your airplane pilot to be too creative, but I'm sure there are situations where it come up where he'd better be creative or she'd better be creative. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I'm gonna read three questions and, uh, and allow you to think about which of these you'd like to answer first. So the first one is, where do you recommend that people go to find a definition of what is good? Is this something that it comes from within? Is this something that comes from natural law? So this has to do with uh, the definition of good. Another one is, so what are your thoughts on the character versus intellect discussion that's currently taking place? Do you see this as consistent with the challenge you presented to IQ when you made the case for multiple intelligences? Or is this something completely new? Uh, I don't know this distinction, because I would assume that one is in favor of both. <laughs> Does it make any sense to you? I'm not sure either. If it's a question of prioritizing, um, I mean, nowadays I'd push character, but, you know, why should you have to choose, right? Yes. Uh, both uh, Emerson and Martin Luther King Jr. talked about how in an education you want to have both. Mm -hmm. I can't give such a quick answer to the first one. What's the third one? The third one, okay. This one you probably could be a little more quick about. Do you get tired of people focusing on your multiple intelligences theory? And in other words, do you wish people would focus more on some of your newer ideas instead of lingering in the past, as it were? And the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, um, but I became a little bit clever about this. I wanted to talk about good work, and people said, come and talk about multiple intelligences. So I called the talk from multiple intelligences to good work, and I spent three minutes on MI and an hour on good work. And the new thing which I'm developing, and I think I'm going to give a TED talk on this um, coming November, is beyond wit and grit. And you can probably figure out by now what that talk is going to say. And if you do, please tell me, so I won't have to. <laughs> but Beyond wit is pluralizing the word wit to wits, namely not just one intelligence but many. And beyond grit means um, it isn't just important to stick to things. You want to stick to things that are worth sticking to and in the end make the world a better, a better place. So I guess my answer is, yeah, I, I mean, you know, I'm sure that no singer who's known for a certain song wants to spend the rest of his or her life, you know, singing, you know, my kind of town, Frank Sinatra or whatever. Uh, so they sing it, but then they talk, sing about the other things, and you never know what it's going to be like. That's the fun of, the fun of life. Uh, um, uh, so, uh, but I mean, I just saw today, there was a nice discussion of the Good Work Project in Frank Bruni's new book about um, how you don't have to all go to the Ivy League schools, and it was nice to see that work of ours and it wasn't actually my work, it was work of one of my students in there. So yeah, I, the answer is yes, I'd rather not talk about MI all the time, but I thank John Brock for giving it uh, a new lease on life. Yeah, yeah. Should I talk so, about the first one? Yeah, so if you have an answer to the first question about where you go to yeah. find answers. To okay, well maybe this is a good one to end on, right? Okay, uh, yes. Because it's, a, it's a, a long and complicated question, or it, it requires more unpacking. Um, I don't know what good is, um, and anything that's complicated requires a lot of thinking and an admission that you could be wrong. Um, and so in the good work enterprise, and something we have created called the Good Work Toolkit, um, which you can access at thegoodproject.org, we don't say these are the 10 ways to be good. We talk about how to think about 
complex issues and how to get to a better place with other people than just thinking you know all the answers yourself. That said, I've made a distinction which I think is important, but as Rick has implied, just because I think something's important doesn't mean that anybody else thinks about that. And that's bet between what I call neighborly morality and the ethics of roles. And I think this is a very important distinction, but I'll be honest with you, it, so far I'm the one who makes it, not a lot of other people. Neighborly morality is how we deal with people who live close to us, who we see every day, and who kind of look like us or seem to belong to our club. I'm using that, obviously, metaphorically. We have evolved to be good neighbors. And if you look at the Ten Commandments, they're about neighbor. How should you treat you know, your parents? How should you treat your neighbor? Should you lie to people? Uh, uh, that sort of thing. Um, I have nothing new, and the golden rule is also about neighbors. You know, don't steal your neighbor's cow because they'll steal yours, don't steal his wife, etc. Uh, I have nothing new to say about that. This doesn't mean that people are all good neighbors, but we, we kind of know there's not a lot of surprises there. What's an entirely new situation is what are the ethics of work in a differentiated society, in a division of labor society, and what is the ethics of roles in a citizenship society. Now, I've just thrown those words at you. If everybody is a farmer or everybody is a hunter, uh, then it, it sort of becomes like neighbor because you're all doing the same thing. But once you get differentiation of labor, one person's an engineer, another one's an accountant, another one a, is a lawyer, another one's a journalist, etc. cetera, um, these are roles which we don't have in our DNA. These are roles that human beings have invented you know, in the last hundreds of years, sometimes just in the last century or so. And there's no rule book where you can look up how to be a good journalist. It doesn't exist. Similarly, people have always lived in communities. But citizenship is, is, a, is a new idea. Uh, comes out of the French Revolution, the American Revolution. I can't help remembering Gandhi's famous phrase. Gandhi was asked, what do you think about Western civilization? Who knows what he said? Anybody? He said it's a good idea, it should be tried. Uh, uh, and, you know, I, don't, I, you know, I, I think many countries now we don't have much of a sense of, of citizenship. So these are difficult roles and you can't look it up and there are no, there are no, no right answers. Um, and so you have to establish common ground and I think it has to be basically face-to-face. Uh, -face. The most complex issues are very hard to work out online. But we have communities of professionals, of workers, and we can get together and talk about the right thing to do. I actually, I haven't talked about this because I just did it this morning, but let me see if I can talk about it because it's really interesting. It's a hypothetical case. A teacher, her name actually is Jennifer Smith. I remember her name. Um, she's teaching in an urban high school. Um, she's young, a good teacher, students like her, it's in a suburb of St. Louis, very tough neighborhood, largely minority students, and they have a zero tolerance policy. And the zero tolerance policy has worked pretty well. It's reduced the number of incidents because it's sort of tough love. Um, and uh, she's been pretty successful with these students, but she's got a student named Wesley, and Wesley is got a high IQ, doesn't say that, but you know, sort of smart kids, but a smart ass too, and is always testing the limits. And he particularly likes to test this diminutive white, he's black, diminutive white history teacher, and um, she gives him an F. But then she decides to work with him, and she works with him almost every day, and he becomes a reasonably good student, and she's so proud of herself because she really thinks she's making something of him. And in fact, she, um, see if you remember this exactly, um, she's meeting with him after school. 
just before Christmas, um, and she's working with him on his work, and she's about to give him a B, which is a tremendous improvement. Um, and then she goes out of the room for a while, and she talks to another teacher, and when she goes back in the room, her $600 cell phone is missing. Um, and it's pretty clear he's taken the cell phone, because when she came back in the room, he made an excuse about how he had to leave right away. And first she rationalized it. He said, well, he's probably eager for vacation, but then she realized he's stolen, she's stolen his phone. Um, and she had mentioned this because she was very upset to another teacher, so she isn't the only person who knows. But the question is, what is Jennifer Smith's, what should she do? Because she knows for a number of reasons, take my word for it, that if she reports this, he will get suspended, and it's a felony, so he may well go to jail. She knows if she doesn't report it, um, and she's found out, then she, there's zero tolerance for the, for the teacher, so she will at the very least be docked her pay, and she may be fired. And then, if you think this isn't complicated enough, um, her husband is getting, a doc, is getting a degree, and she's the sole bedwinner, and, she, and uh, she's pregnant. <laughs> now, you tell me, guys, is there some place in the Ten Commandments which is going to tell you what to do in that situation? Of course not. It's a very complicated ethical situation. I actually spent an hour this morning putting forth my ideas. I'm not going to tell you because it's a good thing what I said, because it's a good thing for you to think about when you're going home. So the answer is when you're in a, in a difficult professional situation, there is no place where you can look it up. If you're a journalist and you're covering a war and you find out that the other side has uh, plots against the side that you identify with, your journalist thinks as, you know, you're supposed to be just covering it. But do you give a warning? You can't look those things up. So that's what, to me, that's the essence of good. You know, not, not should you lie to your parents or should you, you know, shoot your neighbor. You don't need me for that. The answers there are obvious, though people do shoot their neighbors and lots of people lie to the kids. And we need to, we need to analyze why do they lie to their parents? Why do they lie to their parents? So you, I, th I think maybe uh, I wanted to end, of, end with this because these are things I'm thinking about all day. They're not easy answers, but full stop. If we have a society where the ethics of professions are waning, are warped, and we have kids who know what it's like to be ethical, but want to put that over, put that away until you know, they get to be rich and powerful, by which time they'll have long since forgotten the, the pledge they made to some experimenter talking to them in Cambridge, uh, we're not going to be admired in the world. We're going to be a subject of disdain. And one of the interesting things about the United States is almost all of our wounds are self-inflicted. You go out of the other parts of the world, that's not true. And so even though I'm not an American firster by any means, I think the way for America to regain its place in the world is not by trying to settle wars, which we can't, but by setting a really good example of good work, good person, and good citizen, and whatever energies I have left are going to be dedicated to that. And there you have it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Rick. Thank you much, Howard. Uh, for those of you with a long drive, you have a lot to talk about on the way back. Uh, that complex moral dilemma is, uh, is, is going to be interesting. Let's please give Howard Gardner one more round of applause. Thank you. And Rick Miller. Thank you very much. This concludes our evening. You have some feedback cards. At the, in your seat. We'd love it if you'd fill it out. We always try to make our symposia uh, better each time we do it, do them. And I uh, have a few uh, just people to thank. Again, Roger Blaze, Provost and Vice President of Academic Affairs, we thank you so much for all you've done to make this a, a great experience. We, uh, you, especially your staff, Susie Thompson, Nick Kindelt, uh, James Hollinger, Pat Joyce, 
and uh, Chris Becker, who uh, is in charge of all the on-screen things and all the things that we've been doing here. So let's give them a round of applause, too. Last but not least, I want to thank my team, uh, Cindy Schaefer, uh, Assistant and Communications Director. We have two interns this semester, uh, Brooke Klimek and uh, yeah, Brooke Klimek and Brandon Browning. And so thank you for making this a very successful event. And I also thank you. And also I think, want to thank you. Uh, for coming tonight. This is a, a weekday. We know that you have that everyone in this day and time are everyone is busy and you have things to do but we thank you for taking time out and coming here. Um, rem please remember as John Brock always reminds us it's the, mo the most important thing we can do is educate our children and also drive carefully keep that conversation going about the moral dilemma and uh, go Cowboys, Hurricane and Sooners. Have a good evening. <laughs>